Okay, so I'm just going to start us off this session with a few um, opening remarks to get our mindsets shifted into a new session. And then, yes, we do have Amanda uh, Bryden to facilitate the, the main body of the session. So this is now session two. <laughs> we didn't want you to have a break. You don't need a break because you're so energised for everything we've done so far. Um, but now we are in a new session to reflect on the centrality of children and their protection. So welcome everyone to this session. Um, the purpose of this session, as I say, is to reflect on this concept further. We've already talked about it quite a lot in the opening and in that fabulous um, timeline session that we've just been through on the evolution of the sector. Um, I think, as you all now know, if you didn't before, the centrality of children and their protection is the goal of the Alliance's 2021 to 2025 strategy. Um, and in that strategy, we have committed to ensuring that it is recognised and prioritised as both essential and life-saving across the humanitarian system. Um, and, you know, Alison's unpacked a bit more about the life-saving criteria for us and how that links in with um, funding opportunities. So this is a really important thing for us to be um, advocating for. But we, we wanted to spend this conference as it came out of the survey that, that we, we invited our members to um, respond to. We really wanted to spend time in this meeting unpacking this concept further. And so that's been done in this back, background paper that we published as a draft, still draft version over the weekend. Um, but in this session and in this paper, we want to look at what does it mean conceptually and what does it mean practically? Um, so I'm going to introduce you a little bit to the paper um, and then we're going to get into some of the details of what's included in it. So um, the paper itself, as you'll, as you'll hear shortly, has received inputs from a number of adults and children over the past weeks and couple of months. Um, and you'll be hearing from some of those people, including the children today, which is very exciting. And many thanks to Ted Izzon for facilitating that. Um, but yes, let's have a little look at the paper itself. So our producers are kindly going to put the link in the chat box and screen share the visual that's, that comes at the very start of the paper. So this is really for those who haven't had a chance to look at it yet. So in this visual, um, we really wanted to encapsulate this concept in one image. So at the centre, you will see um, our, we've highlighted um, children's agency, children's diversity, um, and children's protection rights at the center. Um, and we really saw in the timeline session that we just had how this is at the center of how the sector evolved. The section that follows then represents the ecological system around the child, the family, the community, the society, including the child protection system that Cornelius and Bill in particular were really um, highlighting the importance of and the link to prevention as part of that. And then the outer ring is the humanitarian system and architecture. These are the sectors that kick in during a humanitarian crisis to supplement the protective factors provided by the existing ecological system. And this is where we need to work differently, as Bill was saying, looking at what was already there in the ecological system and, and, and complementing it rather than taking over. So in the paper itself, in case you're, you've got it open now and having a look, but in case not as well, we look at why this is important. We also look at what do we mean by the centrality of children, looking at their views, capacities, needs and vulnerabilities, and the centrality of children's protection from abuse, exploitation, neglect and violence. And then we look at what it means for the different kinds of humanitarian actors, whether they're humanitarian leaders, humanitarian workers or donors. And then it ends with a call to action to which we're looking at you to be allies and influencers in disseminating and advocating for. And with that focus on advocacy, I'll hand to Elspeth Chapman, our strategic partnerships and advocacy specialist at the Alliance Secretariat. Thank you, Elspeth. Over to you. Thank you so much, Camilla. So I'm just going to provide a very brief overview of the process. So the process in developing the short narrative and graphic so that we can better define the centrality of children and their protection. So as Camilla highlighted in the introduction, um, the centrality of children and their protection is the overarching goal of the current alliance. 
compliance strategy, a strategy that was flagged earlier as a listening process that was developed over the course of a year in 2020 and 2021, based upon consultations with hundreds of stakeholders from across the CPH sector and beyond. So the centrality of children and their protection, it fits squarely within their centrality of protection and humanitarian action, which, as we know, is the system-wide commitment to placing children, um, to, to placing pro um, protection at the centre of humanitarian action. As outlined in the strategy, child protection interventions and approaches, they provide concrete routes to operationalise centrality of protection and can help all stakeholders to meet their protection obligations and responsibilities. However, uh, given the scope and complexity of the concept, which goes well beyond the child protection sector, it requires commitment, understanding and action across all levels of the humanitarian system. We have been developing this short narrative and graphic to better define what we mean. It can be used as a tool for all of us here, a tool when working across sectors, when engaging with humanitarian leadership externally, but also internally within our own organizations, with our own leadership, which was highlighted um, in the previous session as an ongoing challenge, um, as well as with donors and colleagues working across sectors. So the Alliance Secretariat and the Advocacy Working Group developed an, an initial draft um, and have since conducted broad consultations on both the graphic and the narrative. This has included, included both bilateral feedback channels um, and also um, a workshop was conducted with Alliance core members and working group and task force leads. I really want to highlight that we have received an incredible amount of detailed and constructive feedback from across the Alliance from many of you here. So the level have, 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 of engagement has been extensive and is really testament to the fact it's so important we get this right. It's also extremely timely um, with the independent review of the Interagency Standing Committee 2016 protection policy recommendations being put into action. It's a critical moment for us to ensure we can use this momentum to place children and their protection um, at the center of these efforts. And these tools will really help that we are unified and clear in our advocacy efforts. So on that, we would just like to extend a huge, um, um, extend our appreciation to all of those here and those in your organizations who have contributed. In line with our strategic priority of accountability and the safe and meaningful participation of children, we have also conducted a process of child engagement. So a huge thanks to Tedazon and specifically our colleague um, Kristen Hope, consultations were held with children taking part in the COVID under 19 initiative. So this is a broad-based coalition of children, young people uh, um, that worked uh, towards including children and young people in decision-making that affects their future. So we listened to their ideas, their perceptions related to the concept of the centrality of children and their protection, and their vision and messages helped um, us to develop this narrative and specifically the graphic. So we are very lucky to be joined here today by Akorede and Jashish, who have been part of this process. Akorede is from Nigeria and is passionate about protecting the rights of children. And Jashish is a COVID under 19 child advisor and child rights activist from Nepal. So I'll hand over the floor to them both so we can hear more about their, their um, involvement in this process. Thank you so much. Hi everyone, I'm Akuride from COVID Under 19, a, bro a broad based coalition of children and young people working towards including children in, de in decision making that affect their future. I'm here to talk about how we contributed to the graphics. We had two sections, and in the first section, we talked about the importance of child protection and the importance of prioritizing child protection in all humanitarian efforts. We did we to, to make a wider audience of this, we were taxed on how to reframe and rephrase child protection in our own words 
and we the children from COVID-19, we talked about representing these in visual statements, like making, making balloons to represent different rights given to us by responsible adults and trusted individuals who fight to protect the rights of children. A month later, we had another session where we reviewed the first draft of the graphics and we had to discuss what we liked about it and what we wanted to be changed. We all came to a conclusion we wanted it to be changed because the first graphics had a picture of just parents and child, which means only parents are responsible for child protection and also children with disabilities were not included in the picture. But now the second graphics, it has an hand which symbolizes the world, which means everyone, irrespective of your status or position in the country or society, we all are responsible for child protection. And I want to pass a message to everyone. In Nigeria, yeah, there are lots of crises, and mostly we, the children, are victims of such crises. I just want to say, I want to tell the adult that in whatever decision they are making, they should put children at the front because, because in the end, we are the next leader of tomorrow. Thank you. And I'm passing on to Jeshit. Thank you so much, Agurude. Hello, everyone. Namaskar. I'm Jeshit, a COVID-19 child advisor from Nepal. Today, I'll be sharing what the idea of children and their protection at the center of humanitarian action means to us. It is an honor for me to, as a child, to address in such an important topic. Thank you for giving us a voice in this high level gathering. We need an environment where our rights, needs, and voices are at the center of every decision that might be affecting our lives. For us, children and their protection at the center of humanitarian action is a call to action that ensures our specific needs, rights, and are identified, addressed, and protected in all times of crisis and emergencies, where our safety uh, from all forms of violence and abuse must be a primary focus to every humanitarian effort. So as I recall my memories of 2015 Nepal earthquake, when I was seven year old child, I feel so hopeless thinking of the lives of those children who were separated oh, from their families and ended up living in the streets. I feel so restless uh, thinking that they no longer have their parents to take care of their needs and safety. The trauma they experience can have a long lasting effect on their well being and development as well. Similarly, uh, the COVID 19 pandemic has brought light to numerous vulnerabilities for children, highlighting the urgent need for humanitarian action that promotes and protects our rights in a post pandemic world. Uh, it is also crucial to address. Uh, the issues that arose during the pandemic, such as children's mental health, violence against children, and the impact of the crisis in, on our education as well. Uh, if adults are not able to bring us to the decision-making table and hear about our experiences, then they will never understand our problems and priorities. So as a result, uh, they will keep assuming our needs and make ineffective decisions based on their assumptions. Hence, uh, it is important that uh, we children are given a floor where our opinions are valued, our experience are acknowledged, and we are given a chance to get involved in policy meetings as well as decision-making processes. Uh, humanitarian professionals have act often acknowledged the importance of instabilizing uh, child-friendly spaces within humanitarian settings where uh, we can learn, play, share, and heal. These spaces should be accessible to all children, including those with disabilities and children from the marginalized group, as well as the girls. Uh, these spaces should also provide uh, opportunities uh, for children in all their diversity to participate meaningfully and to be involved in the planning, designing, and evaluation of humanitarian responses. So as children, we call upon you, the adults, stakeholders, policymakers, and governments to be more accountable and responsible for our rights. We invite you to prioritize our best interests and consider our views to uphold the principle of placing children and their protection at the heart of humanitarian action. Thank you for having me. Over to the moderator.
Thank you, Jashish and Ekaridi. I think those were brilliant presentations and also a huge thanks for all the work that you and your colleagues and fellow children have been putting into the presentation um, and the, the narrative and infographic. Your views are really, really important uh, for us to be including, making sure that this concept is one that's grounded in your reality and those of children around the world. Um, so thanks very much for making the time. It's fantastic to have you here. We're going to now do a, a piece of audience engagement. Um, we've got a Mentimeter that's coming into the chat. And we want to ask you the question. We've heard from Jashish and Akaridi, but for you, what is the first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the term centrality of children and their protection? So if you click on the link in the chat, and uh, be able to fill in your answer and we can see um, what springs to your mind this quite complex um, concept. And you're also welcome to put uh, thoughts in the chat as well. Child focused, brilliant. Multi-sectorial program, voices of children, working across sectors. Yeah, I think shared responsibility is definitely a huge one. Great, lots of answers flowing in here. And these are all going to be really, really useful as we um, refine and finalize the narrative and, and infographic as well. Mainstreaming, working across sectors. You can tell this is an audience that is uh, experts in child protection. Great. Lots on children's voices, child-centered, child participation. That's really, really fantastic. Excellent. Now I'm conscious of time, so please keep inputting your answers in. We'll be capturing all of these and making sure we're, we're sense checking across the, the narrative and infographic. Um, I'm now going to be passing over to Hani um, Mansurian. We're going to be doing an exciting panel segment for the next part of this session. Hani, I will hand over to you to introduce our panelists. Great, thank you very much, everyone, particularly Akureda and Jeshis for the really inspiring input, uh, both through the process, but also now uh, putting out a call for participation of children and listening to their voice. I would like to invite Ina Kaloga and Ron Powell's. Ina is the Senior Director of Violence Prevention and Response for the International Rescue Committee, and Ron Powell's is the Coordinator of the Global Child Protection Area of Responsibility. Welcome both of you to this panel, and thanks for making time. So we have uh, we have heard we have heard about uh, the concept. We have we all we have heard about the the paper that we have developed and the and the graphic. Uh, so consider and and the call that children put out for us to to actually do place their uh, their protection at the center of uh, of humanitarian response. So I'll start with you, Ina. What, in your opinion, is the connection between the concept of centrality of children and their protection and the rights of children? Are they one and the same, or are they different? And what might be the differences? Thanks a lot, honey, and. Um... Thanks uh, everyone for a very exciting meeting. Um, the question you, you asked has been resonating in my mind throughout the previous sessions and particularly some of the, uh, the great insights we got from Cornelius, Allison and Bill. Um, the rights of children are still a reality that we're striving to make happen uh, when we look at the timeline of our sector and the Alliance. It's very clear that there is a kind of consensus on the fact that rights of children are foundational to societal development, both in crisis and uh, in non-crisis context. And we all know that we still have challenges that continue to exist. The, the connection I see between the rights of children and the centrality of children and her protection is that affirming the centrality of children and her protection adds an operational imperative to do the work we do as humanitarian actors. It's not only the what we should do, but it's really the how we do it. It's also uh, shifts the focus from the North Star that are the rights 
to the vehicle that are our operational practices, the way we program, the way we share the responsibility. I think that's something that came through the Mentimeter, shared responsibility, the way we share the responsibility to realize the rights of children in their lives at this very moment, and not something aspirational that stems from what we all are envisioning as a better future for children. It makes upholding children's rights, mitigating risks of violence, abuse, or neglect, a, response, a responsibility and a quality dimension of all humanitarian action, whether within the child protection sector, but also beyond the child protection sector. So really zooming out to help us refocus on the centrality of our rights, of our well-being and of our protection and what it means about us as a sector and the quality of our interventions. Fantastic, Ina. Thank you very much for that. Really putting it in perspective of the vision that we have, the North Star, as you put it, uh, and the very practical element of how, how we get there, um, which is the centrality of children and their protection. Thank you very much. Um, Nelson Mandela is known to have said, the true character of society is revealed in how it treats its children. With that, I'll ask a question, a question to uh, Ron. Ron, how do you connect the, the concept of centrality of children and their protection to centrality of protection that some of the speakers spoke about already? Thank you, Annie, for, uh, for the question and uh, great to be part of this, uh, of this exciting event. Um, let's just first look at sort of what, how the centrality of protection is being described. And I say described because there's not necessarily one sort of clear definition, but the elements of centrality of protection are that it's a principle in, in, in our humanitarian work that emphasizes a rights-based approach that we now also refer to in addressing the, the root causes of, of human rights violations, rather than just simply responding to the, to the results thereof. Um, in the 2013 IESC statement on the centrality of protection, Protection is actually recognized as the purpose and the outcome of humanitarian action, which also means that the humanitarian coordinators, country teams are responsible for ensuring that protection is central in humanitarian action. And this means identifying who's at risk, how and why at the very outset of a crisis and thereafter, and taking into account the specific vulnerabilities that underlie these risks. It also describes that protection of all persons affected and at risk must inform humanitarian decision making and response. And which means that in turn that uh, humanitarian coordinators, humanitarian country teams and clusters and AORs need to develop and implement a comprehensive protection strategy to address this risk and to prevent and stop the recurrence of violations of international human rights and humanitarian law. Now, obviously, protection of all persons affected and at risk includes children. And wherever protection is mentioned in, in the description of the centrality of protection, we should also read that as child protection. Sounds very logical, but as we all know, we still need to make that very clear and make the case that protection also includes child protection. Moreover, as we also heard from, uh, from the children speaking earlier, children make up, often make up the majority of populations affected by the humanitarian crisis. And they are a substantial stakeholder group in humanitarian response. And also all humanitarian actors have a responsibility for the protection of children and also upholding their rights. Um, in, in addition, when, when humanitarian action plays, actors place protection at the center, and children at its core, it will actually ensure a comprehensive and effective humanitarian response. And why is that? Because child protection interventions and approaches provide concrete routes to, to operationalize the centrality of protection. It can help all stakeholders to meet their protection obligations and responsibilities. So for example, child protection risks and vulnerabilities are often directly linked to broader, even systemic violations of human rights signposting other protection needs and as many child protection risks are also multifaceted in nature child protection can also provide the linkages and entry points that integrate and connect the activities of multiple sectors to strengthen the protection outcomes and is also and as also stated in the in the background paper that 
Camilla uh, was was referring to, and Elspeth were were, were mentioning, um, by its very nature, realizing the protection of children and their full array of lives, rights further helps ensure the well-being of all societies. So as children are embedded in the ecosystem of families, communities, and the broader society, ensuring children's well-being cannot be achieved without also investing in the whole system. So in short, fully integrating the concept of centrality of, of children and their protection is not only right and makes the centrality of protection a fully rights-based approach, it also makes programmatic sense and it can only strengthen the implementation of the concept of centrality of protection. Fantastic. Thank you, Thank you very much, Ron, for that comprehensive response. Um, I think I think that element of protection being the purpose and the outcome of humanitarian action, and extending that to the to the world of children and 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 their environment is is extremely important. And I and I kind of I see how as both of you are speaking, a lot of the elements that Allison, uh, Cornelius, and Bill mentioned are keep coming back. So they're all alive. The issue of systems that. Um, that they mentioned the issue of uh, convincing senior management of the importance of uh, of children and 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 their protection. Also, the 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 point that you made, Ron, about how protecting children will mean will translate into um, the whole society being being better off. So the the protective environment that that one of the speakers earlier um, talked about. So um, before I go back to uh, to Ina, I'll also mention, which actually relates a quote that also relates to the centrality of protection uh, from now Mahatma Gandhi, at least um, known to be to have said, the measure of a civilization is how it treats its weakest members, which would in many situations in, include children. Um, now, Ina, I want to come back to you and ask, uh, in your view. What are, what are some of the obstacles in positioning the centrality of children and their protection across the humanitarian sector? What key steps could the Alliance and broader child protection uh, in humanitarian action community take to make sure that this concept is widely understood first and then adopted by the broader humanitarian community? Over to you. Thanks, Hani. Um, I think previous speakers have spoken to some of the challenges we have in positioning child protection itself. And I think these are similar to the challenges we're facing to position the centrality of children's rights and protection. And those include prioritization. I think Alison spoke to the recent evolution of the life-saving criteria, which is a positive evolution. But we do know that most of the practitioners in this school and beyond still struggle to make that case, not only to her leadership in her organization, but to the wider system and at times to donors, making sure it is understood, but it is also the, the criteria is translated into actual prioritization as we uh, position, design, and implement humanitarian programs. Second is a point that really resonated uh, with me from um, Alison's and, and Cornelia's earlier points, surround accountability. Uh, I do believe we have a lot to learn from the trajectory of change and evolution of our gender-based violence colleagues uh, in terms of how we tell the story of funding not acquired, funding not spent properly, um, results not framed in a way that speaks to the specific challenges that children face in humanitarian action. Uh, we're just a few years after the Steel Unprotected report and some areas of that report still are true today in terms of shares of funding available, but also the kind of programming that is legitimately and intentionally framed as child protection. As we saw our timeline, family separation and conflict and children associated with armed groups had historically dominated what was considered as child protection uh, in the humanitarian sector. We've evolved to really understand this in a more nuanced and more complex through manner that encompasses a systems approach to child protection that understands that the drivers of family separation and association of children by armed forces and groups go deeper than the click when the conflict started or when the hurricane hit that are really 
undercurrent that we need to address. So those obstacles that are both conceptual, uh, administrative, budgetary, require us to do exactly what Bill uh, was pointing to, to balance the complexity of our sector with a way to channel data and evidence to other sectors, to tell the story of the fact that 60% of our beneficiary in most contexts are children, and that the majority of the people we serve have care responsibility towards children in their lives that needs to be operationalized in a way that serves those children's needs, voices, and aspiration, and that we're not just property of our parents. The second is around a unique opportunity I see for our sector as we talk more and more about Nexus programming. Uh, the child protection sector is uniquely placed to say that story of intergenerational risks and also of the different environments in which they are um, exacerbated and in which they tend to creep on children of her families. Telling that story will require of us to be able to connect with our sister sector organization and other sectors to understand the way they work, which we understand sometimes better than they do the way we do work, but also to help them bring a child lens to the way they function, their program, their budget. One key area I believe uh, is as critical and potentially uh, transformative for the whole humanitarian sector is really truly defining accountability benchmarks and criteria and indicators that position protection in general and the protection of children as a major quality indicator of what we do in emergencies. If we fail children, we fail, our, our response is questionable. If we don't address the drivers of exclusion, discrimination at population level in a way that feeds uh, into transformational change for intergenerational dynamics, we've also failed as a sector. However, today, our humanitarian responses do not are not assessed by those criteria. And it's very important that we move uh, along the, the history of our sector in, this, in the direction of more accountability, more data, more evidence, and more capacity to translate the complexity of child protection into data that other sectors can, can can integrate into multi-sectoral programming, but most importantly, into multi-sectoral uh, outcomes for children. Fantastic, thanks, Ina. Um, many great points. I'll pick up on the on the point you made on on accountability, which again leads links back to something that I think Alison mentioned in her last comment about how we need to have indicators to for our for our leadership um, to be measured in a way that it actually shows accountability to children. And unless we are we are able to do that, we are, we're not able to hold ourselves or our, our uh, kind of the, the, the entire infrastructure of humanitarian action accountable towards, towards children. Um, I will ask one last question, Ron, to you. Um, how do you think we can measure success in promoting this concept? So what, what would success look like? Uh, if if we were to be successful in a few years, yeah, I, and I think I mean it links to to a large extent also to the issue of accountability. But I think the the success is how, what it looks like is is in my opinion well outlined in the in the background vote. Um, I think we can say that as a child protection and humanitarian action community, we we are successful when actually the humanitarian leadership, including Unitarian coordinators, humanitarian country teams really make the protection of all children a strategic objection, objective in humanitarian action and also collective outcome that uh, the humanitarian response is accountable for, integrating across the response. So not just in the protection response, but across the response uh, of all the, all the sectors, all the clusters. Um, it, success also... Uh, includes that humanitarian sectors and actors beyond protection are systematically considering also the capacities and needs and vulnerabilities of children in their programming uh, and including very importantly uh, children's own participation and they consider that this contribution of, of each sector to protection and well-being of children including through uh, working with child protection actors 
And then finally, and, and more importantly, as, or more important, but importantly, because as we saw in the recent unprotected report that was done for the Oslo Conference on the Protection of Children in Armed Conflict, humanitarian donors are, are critical in, in supporting a multi-sector and multi-year flexible funding, which contributes to child protection outcomes. So they also require uh, funding partners to, to adhere to the minimum standards for child protection humanitarian action, promoting the use of programmatic approaches that are child sensitive and informed, and invest and continue to invest in supporting capacity strengthening and capacity sharing efforts for both the, the child protection community, but also for other sectors to really implement quality programming that's, that enhances the protection and well being of children. Now, more concrete, concretely, and building on something that's happening at the moment, is that um, is that we need to continue to influence the work that is currently in process within the IESC Task Force One on Centrality of Protection, which is following up on the recommendations of the, of the review of the implementation of the IESC Protection Policy. This task force has been uh, asked to to draft an action plan and benchmarks for collective implementation of the IESC. Policy on Protection and Humanitarian Action. And this action plan will be presented to the ISC principles. So concretely, this means that we, we need to continue to advocate through the child protection representatives in the task force, such as IOM, Save the Children, and UNICEF. And we can do that through the task team that uh, the Alliance and the Global CPIR are jointly chairing. And to have children's, uh, children's lens included in the products that are produced by this task force, such as a centrality of protection toolkit um, that, uh, that includes, for example, an eight memoir, the benchmarks and protection outcome, outcomes measurements considerations tool. So once disseminated, um, the uh, humanitarian coordinators will be presented with a menu of options for support in using the COP uh, toolkit. And we should make sure that as a child, uh, child protection community, we, we are part of, of that support uh, within the menu of options so we can really influence the use of the, of the toolkit from a children's uh, perspective. So I would see that as something concretely that we can do on the, in, the, in the short term. Great. Thank you very much, Ron, for that. Um, very important point to bring up on the, the whole process that is happening around the centrality of protection and the role that we can play to center children within centrality of protection. Um, and hopefully as, as a community that, uh, which is the, the broader protection community, if you're all aligned, uh, we will be able to achieve much more. Um, with that, I would like to uh, close this part of the session and thank Ina and Ron for being with us. I'll just mention one more quote from Herbert, Herbert Hoover, the 31st president of the United States, who says, children are the most valuable resource we have. Um, over to Amanda. Thanks very much, Hani, and huge thanks to Inna and Ron for your insights and reflections. I think this is such a, a rich area and um, been working on the narrative and infographic, but still continuing to learn and reflect on how we take this work forward. Um, last couple of minutes, I want to speak to, to next steps about this initiative. So we'll be working with our members, uh, including the leads of the working groups and task forces at the Alliance, as well as ch the children and young people we've consulted so far to finalize the narrative and the infographic. So securing a, a last round of reflections and feedback. And we'll of course be drawing on this session and the reflections of all of you and the mentee as well. Uh, secondly, we'll be exploring as well with the Alliance Working Groups the development of any additional guidance on the implementation and practice, like Anna mentioned earlier, looking at how we are implementing the centrality of children, children and their protection, including how we link to multi-sectoral ways of working and engage with those outside the child protection sector. Well, um, part of this, we could be looking at dissemination plans, how we can continue to support the implementation across child protection networks and beyond. I think I'm really excited about the, these tools. They're going to be central to our advocacy communication, also our programming efforts and how we embed these concepts and 
um, uh, the idea of children and the centrality of their protection and key forms in humanitarian action. So we're very much looking forward to taking this tool forward to further understand the prioritization of this work. With you all, please do have a look at the infographic and the link that's been shared earlier in the session. Um, very much welcome your feedback and thanks for those who've put questions in the chat as well. I think that brings this session to a close, but um, uh, we're um, looking forward to seeing a lot of you on the next session and throughout the week as we continue to talk about this uh, key theme for the annual meeting and child protection across the board. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.